Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's third installment of our ACEs Aware Science series. In the first segment, California Surgeon General Dr. Nadine Burke Harris focused on the basics of adverse childhood experiences and how they can lead to toxic stress and ultimately have lifelong health consequences. The second segment featured Al Race of the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. Mr. Race discussed the intersections between ACEs, toxic stress, and child development, and highlighted some promising approaches for mitigating toxic stress. I am thrilled to announce today's presenter, Dr. Rachel Gilgoff. Dr. Gilgoff has been a champion of the ACEs Aware Initiative, serving as a clinical and science advisor to the Surgeon General, and supporting the development of much of our work around implementation of ACE screening over the past year. Dr. Gilgoff brings more than a decade of experience as a board certified general pediatrician, as well as a child abuse pediatrician. After 10 years with the Bay Area Research Consortium, she supported the development and implementation of the Pediatric ACEs and Related Life Events Study, or PEARLS, that is now the center of our ACEs Aware screening efforts. Dr. Gilgoff also served as the Medical Director of Clinical Innovation and Research at the Center for Youth Wellness, and then also the Chief Medical Officer for Stronger Brains Incorporated, a computer-based program to improve executive functioning and social and emotional wellness for children impacted by adversity. Finally, Dr. Gilgoff recently graduated from a fellowship in Pediatric Integrative Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine and continues to serve as the Clinical and Science Advisor for the ACEs Aware Initiative. In her work, Dr. Gilgoff has done a great deal of thinking and studying early intervention strategies that can help prevent longer-term health consequences known as ACE-associated health conditions that all too often respond from trauma and toxic stress. She's going to share some of those concrete approaches with all of you today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rachel Gilgoff. Thank you so much, Jen, and hello to everybody. Thank you for being here today on this webinar. My hope for the next 40 minutes is to present concrete steps that you can take to help children, adults, ourselves, our families, our friends, heal and grow after ACEs. So the objectives for this talk are to give you tools to help you develop your clinical response to ACEs and toxic stress, dig into the science behind each of the evidence-based strategies for toxic stress regulation, provide examples of clinical interventions, and give resources and support services for stress mitigation strategies. So next slide. So let's get right into some of the steps in developing our clinical response to ACEs and toxic stress. Next slide. And this is what we already do in clinical practice, right? We gather information, we then interpret that information to make a clinical assessment and then develop our treatment plan. So what I'm presenting here today is about folding in ACEs and a trauma-informed lens. Next slide. And what I mean by that is, for example, when we're asking about the patient's concern, reviewing the medical history, doing our physical exam, and when we're doing that, thinking about whether there are signs and symptoms that may be related to ACE-associated health conditions that we ask about protective and risk factors, including asking about the toxic stress mitigation strategies. So that would include relationships, sleep, nutrition, physical activity, mindfulness practices, nature experiences, and mental health support. And that we review all clinic screeners that we might be doing in our clinical practice. So this would include the pediatric and early life event screener pearls for children and adolescents or the ACE questionnaire for adults, as well as any additional screening tools that you may already be part of may already be doing as part of standard practice. So this could be the PHQ-9 if your clinic is doing it to screen for depression, or if your clinic has unmet basic needs screeners. Next slide. And once we've talked to the patient, reviewed the chart, reviewed our screening tools, done our examination, we can look at the ACE score and if there are any potential clinical manifestations of toxic stress, those ACE-associated health conditions, to make a clinical assessment as to how concerned we are. What is the risk this patient has for toxic stress? And using this assessment and the patient's strengths and protective factors, we can really guide effective clinical responses. So the rest of my talk will really be leaning into the clinical response part of this algorithm. Next slide. 
When developing a treatment plan, we can use the seven evidence-based strategies as areas in which we can provide education, interventions, and support services, and structured follow-up for our patients. Because what is it that we really want to know? We want to know what we can do in that clinical visit to help our patients. And these seven areas, these evidence-based strategies, have all been shown to reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and enhance neurologic function key mechanisms that could counteract that toxic stress response and potentially improve overall health and well-being. And these are things that we as providers can use to treat toxic stress in the clinic. And if you get one thing from my talk today, I hope it's this, that toxic stress is treatable and we have tools and strategies to help people here. They'll heal their physiology. And I want to put a plug in for the Surgeon General's report and just let you know that pretty much everything I will talk about in this presentation is in the tertiary prevention section of that report. So let's jump into each of the evidence-based toxic stress strategies. Next slide. Starting with my personal passion, supportive relationships. Next slide. A growing body of research is identifying the positive impacts of relational health. So this includes supportive relationships and social engagement on our neuro, endocrine, immune, and metabolic functioning. We see that responsive caregiving has been shown to inhibit HPA access reactivity in the presence of stressors, that supportive partners can also improve cortisol regulation for their significant others. Social support has been associated with lower blood pressure, decreased risk for cardiovascular disease, and lower plasma and urinary catecholamine stress hormone levels. Oxytocin, I find this fascinating. In animals, they have found that the amygdala has oxytocin receptors, and that allows oxytocin to actually inhibit the amygdala-induced stress response. And we see signs of this in human studies as well. Oxytocin has been shown and associated with um, enhanced bonding, with protection against stress-induced cell death. It has anti-inflammatory effects. It enhances metabolic homeostasis and has been shown to protect vascular endothelium. So could it be a potential therapeutic agent for ACEs and toxic stress? And I'll put a little asterisk to this in that it has been shown to promote us versus them mentality, really bonding with your group, but potentially increasing negativity toward an L group. So we really need precision medicine research and approaches to identify which of our patients could benefit the most from oxytocin. And then social support has been found to predict natural killer cells, helper T cells, cytokine levels. It's been associated with decreased asthma symptoms and improved immune responses, and even less susceptibility to the common cold. Um, uh, a study of mine that I really like is that it, it showed that hugging had a stress buffering immune protective effect. And actually hugs explain 32% of the attenuating effect of social support on infection risk. Next slide. To highlight three systematic reviews on interventions for children, first, Slopin and colleagues did a systematic review of 19 articles and demonstrated that clinical interventions designed to improve social relationships, environments, or psychosocial functioning for children could actually alter their cortisol activity. Another systematic review by Dr. Marie Mitchell looked at 22 articles of interventions in pediatric primary care to improve ACE-related child outcomes and found that multi-component interventions that included parenting education and mental health support and social services referrals were associated with improvements in the parent-child relationship and behavioral and mental health outcomes. Bopari and colleagues, they identified three key elements in their systematic review, a focus on strong parenting skills, earlier intervention placement and greater intervention engagement, and that these were, improved, were associated with improved or even normalized stress hormone profiles and decreased the impact of toxic stress um, related injuries on brain development and epigenetic regulation. And while these reviews all involved pediatric patient cohorts, the interventions really used a whole family approach and a lot of them were targeted at the parent. So thinking about ways to coach and engage parents, this could be in internal medicine, family medicine, ob and pediatrics, to work with adults and to think of the whole family because the parent may also need to address their ACEs in order to help their child. Next slide. 
I want to show you all a study of longitudinal data from four nationally representative studies that evaluated social integration and social support in adolescents, young adulthood, and late adulthood. So not about ACEs and toxic stress in particular, um, but about that social and supportive relationships and integration. And just to orient you to all of these graphs, the x-axis is increasing social integration. The y-axis are those health outcomes that we're going to look at. Triangles are late adulthood, squares are young adulthood, and gray diamonds are the adolescents. And they found that social integration, so they define this as parent contact, friend count, religious attendance, and activities participation, that the more of these you had, it was associated in a dose-dependent manner with lower C-reactive protein, that's the top left, lower systolic blood pressure, that's the top right, lower waist circumference on the bottom left, and then in this bottom right, lower BMI, body mass index in an adolescence, and higher BMI in late adulthood. So this shows that social integration, increasing the number of our connections with other people, that that can improve physiologic markers of good health. And what we need is the research to see if this is particularly helpful for people with ACEs, right? And could this even reverse their toxic stress physiology? Next slide, 12. Some of the most startling work in this area of social support and physical health outcomes has been done by Dr. Julianne holt Lundstad and her team. And they've shown the impact that social integration and social support can have on our mortality, how long we live. And from two of her important meta-analyses studies on social support and mortality, we know that individuals with adequate social relationships have a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those with poor or insufficient social relationships. And looking at this graph for perspective, she compared her data to mortality data from other researchers, uh, from other research on other known risk factors for mortality. And she found that social support, so having these close supportive nurturing relationships and social integration, being connected with a variety of people and groups, that both of these in the top three rows, right, had comparable effects on mortality as smoking up to 14 cigarettes a day and a greater impact on our mortality than excessive alcohol intake, physical activity, BMI, drug treatment for hypertension, and air pollution. So again, if toxic stress can lead to poor health, can we in primary care, care help patients build these supportive relationships and networks of relationships to improve their health and lifespan? And we need these types of intervention studies to be conducted in primary care to see specifically how we can move this needle for patients with ACEs. Slide 13. And going back to what we really want to know, right? How can we use this science to make a difference for our patients' health and well being? Um, and just to say that what I'm presenting is a conceptual framework, right? It's not based on studies that have specifically divided interventions in this way. So, really, risk level could be considered based on ACE screening, um, but it could also be considered based on their level of need in each of these individual stress, toxic stress mitigation strategy domains. So for example, if you see someone struggling in their relationships, regardless of their ACE score, this could also be used as a framework. So what can we do for our patients at any risk level in this supportive relationship domain, in this green area, this universal education? We can let all our patients know that we live longer with safe, stable, nurturing relationships and a sense of belonging and community. We can talk about hugs being protective, right? How to stay connected in this time that's hard with physical distancing. For those in the intermediate risk level, ones that need more targeted interventions, for example, in pediatrics, we think about talk, read, seeing, and reach out and read, and we have these as literacy programs. We can also use them as relationship building tools. We can encourage time in, and this works at any age across the lifespan, taking 15 minutes to put our phones down, focus on our kids, focus on a friend, call a relative to really boost our relationships and potentially our health and longevity. We can help our patients connect with community programs. This could be sports teams, religious affiliations, faith communities. We could connect them to support groups. We could offer group clinic visits at our site. And then for families or adults that are really struggling, right, that may need extra indicated support, we can refer them to home visiting programs, parenting programs, mental health programs to specifically focus on helping them improve their relationships, 
family therapy or even targeted dyadic therapies such as child parent psychotherapy or couples therapy. Slide 14. So that was a deep dive on supportive relationships. Let's turn to quality sleep and do the same uh, deep dive. Slide 15. So sleep disturbances are among the most common outcomes of childhood adversity. And this can actually include increased, decreased, or disordered sleep. Nightmares are one of the symptoms of PTSD diagnosis. And there's this bi-directional relationship. So stress can worsen sleep and then lack of sleep can actually activate our stress response system. And we see this in increases in norepinephrine, epinephrine, blood pressure, lack of sleep is associated with increased appetite. I know I start eating more munchy food when I'm tired. It's also associated with elevated insulin and blood glucose levels and insulin resistance. In adults, disordered or reduced sleep duration is associated with a lot of the same ACE-associated health outcomes, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, depression, anxiety. Similarly, in children, poor sleep is associated with impairments in neurocognitive development, social emotional skills, reports of physical health issues, and family functioning. So understanding these mechanistic pathways linking trauma, disordered sleep, and poor health is really a window of opportunity for interventions that we could use to support good health and resilience. Slide 16. So we see, and, and studies have shown that quality sleep can improve neurologic, autonomic, endocrine, metabolic, and immune function. It can support memory consolidation. It allows for the normal circadian rhythms of cortisol levels. It supports decreases in sympathetic nervous system output. Normal sleep increases growth hormone, prolactin, and melatonin. And healthy sleep is associated with regulating our immune function and overall decreasing inflammation reducing our risk of infection, and has been shown to be associated with improved response to vaccinations. So important today. Slide 17. So how do we translate this to clinical practice? So the green zone, universal education, we can talk to our patients about how common sleep problems can be with childhood adversity and stress. And we already know the standard sleep hygiene recommendations. No caffeine, electronics, alcohol close to bedtime, have a bedtime routine. If you don't fall asleep in 20 minutes, get out of bed, do something relaxing so that the bed stays a conditioned place for sleep. And then for people who are struggling with sleep, who might need yellow or red level of response, those people who don't feel restored and rested when they wake up, who have trouble falling asleep initially or have trouble staying asleep, maybe because of nightmares or restless sleep or pain. It's important to know that these people um, may need extra support, right? They may need more than that routine sleep hygiene. So different or flexible bedtime routines, a night light, a weighted blanket, relaxation techniques that they could use to help them fall asleep. This could be journaling at night or really encouraging conversations with a trusted adult about strategies to address the specific worry that's keeping them up at night. I'm thinking about ways during the days to help them release that stress energy. We'll talk about that in physical activity section or to help them maintain calm. So meditation or yoga can also, and has been shown to improve sleep. And for red zone, for people with significant sleep disturbances, they may need additional assessments, sleep studies, and interventions may be indicated like medications, melatonin, or for example, prezosin has been shown to be helpful for PTSD related nightmares. And targeted cognitive behavioral therapies for insomnia exist. Slide 18. So moving on to balanced nutrition. Slide 19. ACEs have been linked to increased risk of obesity, insulin resistance, and diabetes, as well as eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa and bulimia. So again, there's this bi-directional relationship between nutrition and stress. For example, malnutrition, undernutrition can actually activate the physiologic stress response. And conversely, stress can affect food behavior, digestive processes, and metabolism. It's fascinating that stress can actually increase or decrease our appetite. And if you think about it, if you're in that sympathetic nervous system phase of the threat response seconds um, to minutes, your body is shifting energy away from digestion and towards the muscles. It's actually making you less hungry. If you're more in that cortisol phase, 
minutes, hours, days after a threat, your body is actually telling you to stock up in case there's another threat. So it's telling you to eat and crave high fat, high sugar foods. And it works. High fat and high sugar, high sugar diets can actually temporarily decrease the cortisol response and actually decrease those feelings of anxiety and stress, which then reinforces this pattern of eating as a way to calm an overactive threat response system. So we really have to be kind to ourselves, kind to our patients, and give them tools to counteract what their normal stress response is telling them to do. Slide 20. So when we look at the impact nutrition can have on our neurologic, endocrine, and metabolic functioning, we see that nutrients such as magnesium, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids can actually support brain function, cell membrane transport, and neurotransmitter production. Excessive sugar consumption can actually increase the risk for heart disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, hepatic dysfunction, so a lot of those ACE-associated health conditions. And then on the flip side, omega-3s have been associated with lower norepinephrine, ACTH, and cortisol in response to stressor challenges. And while pesticides, fast food, and overly processed foods are pro-inflammatory, vegetables, whole grains, and omega-3s have been associated with decreased inflammation. Slide 21. So translating this again into clinical practice, we can talk to our patients in trauma-informed, non-blaming, shaming ways and let them know that their stress response is trying to protect them and tell them to stock up on these high-fat, high-calorie foods so we can really partner with them on strategies such as having easy access to healthy high-fat or high-sugar foods like nuts, avocados, and fruits, and putting the junk food higher up so that you have time to be mindful and think about a healthier option. We can think about anti-inflammatory diets for all our patients. For this intermediate level, we could consider supplementation with things like omega-3 fatty acids to really help calm the immune system. For trauma-informed um, practices, we could offer multidisciplinary weight loss programs. We could tie into other domains, right? Eating with family and friends, being mindful about our eating. We can consider involving a nutritionist or dietitian for added support. And then for the red zone, they really may need a referral to a specialist, to anorexia or obesity programs, to cardiologists, endocrinologists, and GI specialists. Slide 22. So moving on to physical activity, slide 23. I think we would all agree on the importance of physical activity to good health and ways that exercise has been shown to improve neurologic, endocrine, metabolic, and immune function include increased hippocampus perfusion, volume, neurogenesis, and synaptic plasticity. And it's interesting, we know that child maltreatment is associated with decreased hippocampal volume, right? So we need research to see if physical activity could actually reverse this change. Physical activity is associated with increased brain-derived neurotrophic factor, improved memory and attention, cognition, academic achievement, and psychosocial functioning, decreased pain perception, and improved mental health. Right, And these may be related to all those releases of hormones like dopamine and endogenous opioid release. Physical activity is fascinating though, because it's actually a bit stressful to our bodies to exercise. And we see that it increases cortisol and catecholamine levels. So that's the opposite of the other ones that we've been talking about. And so part of the way it may actually help is to promote improved regulation of the stress response, essentially building physiologic resilience. And we see suggestions of this in the relationship between exercise and the immune response, where during exercise, there's increased immune cell counts and cytokine levels. And then for a period after the exercise, there's decreased lymphocytes and antibody response so that regular routine, moderate exercise over time has been shown to lead to this general anti-inflammatory effect and heightened immune surveillance. So increased immune system regulation. Slide 24. Other ways that physical activity can help individuals affected by ACEs by increasing resilience factors, such as skill development, self-regulation, problem-solving abilities, and a sense of self-agency. It can support healthy relationships, right, through team sports or taking a walk with a friend, and it can help us sleep better. My favorite part of physical activity is that it can help metabolize that 
increased energy associated with stress, right? All that extra glucose running around through my body. If I get up and do a few jumping jacks, I'm actually breaking that energy down. Slide 25. So we can talk to everyone about the health benefits of physical activity, which I'm sure we already do, right? And for the yellow zone, when we need more targeted interventions, we can think about, for example, a child who's experienced ACEs and is hyper aroused, hyper vigilant at school, maybe more activated by threats, perceived threats, somebody dropping a pencil in the back of the room and have trouble sitting still. And for that child, brief physical activity breaks could really help release that stored excess energy release that and break down that glucose that's that's coursing through their blood. And this works for us adults too, right? If we're in a stressful meeting, a stressful Zoom call, in that break, we could get up and do the 25 jumping jacks. We could take a walk down the hall and back and really metabolize that energy. We can write exercise prescriptions. We can recommend moderate intensity aerobic activity for longer durations, 30 to 60 minutes, three or more times a week to really practice that healthy stress response, right? And we could talk about it in that way. We can encourage activities that combine physical activity with self-regulation skills and breathing techniques. So this would be martial arts and yoga, and they may be extra beneficial from in that healing from ACEs and toxic stress because they're getting both aspects. And for the red zone, recognizing that, unfortunately it's pretty hard and it's harder to exercise, particularly when we need it most, right? When we're in the midst of the threat response. So helping people be kind to themselves, being kind to ourselves, and really offering ways to get over this barrier. So that could be professional support, like trainers, support groups, or even thinking about clinic-based exercise programs. And I hope that you're seeing that all of this is doable, that we're already doing a lot of these strategies and that they could really impact neurologic, immune, endocrine, and metabolic functioning that could be used to treat the toxic stress we see in our patients. Slide 26. So moving on to mindfulness practices. Slide 27. Mindfulness has been defined as non-judgmental, moment-to-moment awareness that involves attention, intention, and a kind attitude. And the science suggests that practicing this awareness, this attention and self-compassion could actually help regulate the stress response and improve function and connectivity among regions of the brain involved in attention, self-referential thinking, and emotional regulation. And mindfulness may really offer a cognitive and behavioral flexibility in the face of stressful events, really increase one's ability to tolerate uncomfortable emotions. And mindfulness has been shown to be helpful for people with ACEs and trauma, PTSD, anxiety and depression, people who are struggling with executive functioning, pain management concerns, ADHD, sleep problems, and parental stress. Slide 28. And fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging studies, have suggested that mindfulness involves primarily the medial frontal cortex, this includes the anterior cingulate cortex, the insula, amygdala, and hippocampus, right, other brain structures that are important to that stress response system. Mindfulness has been shown to improve default mode network processing, and again, supporting that self-referential thinking. And from a stress reduction perspective, mindfulness has been associated with decreased sympathetic activation, lower blood pressure, and improved parasympathetic parasympathetic activity. And even the American Heart Association has actually said that overall studies of meditation suggest a possible benefit on cardiovascular risk, and that given the low cost and low risk of this intervention, it really could be considered as an adjunct to regular cardiovascular risk reduction. Immune function, mindfulness has been associated with improved immune immune function. And a meta-analysis actually suggested that mindfulness could influence markers of inflammation, cell-mediated immunity, and biological aging. Um, We do have some work to go, but there's so much promise for mindfulness in the healing of ACEs and toxic stress. Slide 29. We can talk to all of our patients about mindfulness. We can even demonstrate some of these mindful practices in clinics, such as four, seven, eight breathing, where you breathe for a count in for a count of four, hold for a count of seven, and then breathe out for a count of eight. For kids, you could have them pretend to blow out candles, or you could give them a pinwheel to blow on. You can talk about how breathing actually slows our heart, breathing out actually slows down our heart rate. 
for people who need more support in this yellow zone, letting people know that there's apps and online videos and there's even free ones. UCLA has a free mindful app. Oprah and Deepak have a 21 day meditation challenge that people just, can just Google and do. For kids, Sesame Street and Communities has a whole section on traumatic stress with really helpful techniques and resources for parents and kids. And then there's also these other mind-body practices to consider like Tai Chi, yoga, acupuncture, massage therapy that are emerging and potential healing services for ACEs and toxic stress. And for people who need extra support, so mindfulness-based stress reduction is an eight-week program with weekly sessions and daily home practice, and programs are available through work wellness programs, hospitals, community organizations, and even online. Slide 30. So moving on to experiencing nature. Slide 31. Interacting with nature is associated with decreased diabetes, depression, heart rate, and blood pressure, and heart disease, and even with living a longer life. In a randomized control trial of 90 patients recovering from surgery, plants and flowers in their hospital rooms were associated with lower blood pressure, lower ratings of pain, anxiety, and fatigue, and higher room satisfaction. And similarly, in another study, patients who had a room with a view looking out on a natural scene had shorter hospital stays and required less pain medication. They found that adding green spaces in low resource communities has been associated with reduced crime and violence and improved perception of safety, increased social connections and reduced depressive symptoms. And nature can improve health and well-being in a number of possible ways. One, there's some evidence that it directly calms the stress response system, which we'll talk about. It helps build resilience by overcoming challenges, right? Saying, I was able to hike that mountain. I was able to cross that bridge. I was able to do something a bit challenging and maybe even a bit scary and know that I'm stronger on the other side for it. It can increase healthy behaviors such as physical activity, mindfulness, and relational health, decrease screen time, and improve sleep. And then, of course, there's tons of research on the, the value of improved air quality and then, of course, sunlight, how it can be beneficial as well. Slide 32. And there's studies showing that interacting with nature could improve cognitive functioning and attention. In a study of 547 adults connected to nature was associated with improved psychological well-being, sense of meaningfulness, and increased energy. Time in nature has been associated with decreased sympathetic nervous system activity and increased parasympathetic nervous system activity. And a study of park prescriptions at a pediatric primary care clinic in an FQHC found that they increased park visits and physical activity and were associated with decreased perceived stress, loneliness, and cortisol levels. Nature has also been linked to decreased blood glucose levels and reduced immune markers. Slide 33. So how to use this in clinical practice? First, letting everyone know that nature can come in many forms. This could be going to your local park, local green spaces, playgrounds, and even possibly indoor plants. And that access and exposure to these natural environments can improve our health. For intermediate risk, you can write a prescription for nature. ParksRx.org has resources for how to make that happen. The Center for Nature and Health also has resources, and you can link patients to safe local parks and give them bus routes on how to get there. And we really need to recognize that social inequality in access to green spaces is a, is a real issue and how this is an additional mechanism by which disadvantaged communities experience poorer outcomes in the face of high stress and adversity. And I encourage you, look at any aerial view on Google Maps in your region, and you'll see that there's less green in the low-income neighborhoods where they often have fewer trees, fewer parks, and fewer green spaces. So extra efforts have to be made to support Black Americans and other minorities in feeling safe and welcome in nature and to increase access to nature. And this is on us and our systems. And for red zone, we can refer to ecotherapy. There are therapists who specialize in nature-based therapy. And there are really exciting adventure-based programs that help build friendships, promote resilience, physical activity, and mental health all in nature. Slide 34. And mental health. Slide 35. 
So mental and behavioral healthcare can help patients build skills and capacities for resilience, directly address trauma-related symptoms, and scaffold with medications if needed, all in the context of a safe, supportive, and trusting relationship. I like to say health is health, and as a friend and colleague says, the brain is connected to the body 100% of the time. So it's really important that we have multidisciplinary care and a bi-directional flow of information between mental and physical health providers. We need increased communication across disciplines, integration of services, and shared treatment plans to improve access and care for individuals, especially those at high risk of toxic stress. And there's, of course, a vast body of literature linking various behavioral and mental health therapies with improved mental health outcomes. What's fascinating and emerging as well are ways that psychological interventions can improve neurobiology, physiology, and physical health outcomes. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Just an asterisk though, before we move on, and that is if you see a patient with a high ACE score, but without a diagnosable mental health condition, there's really not a mechanism or sufficient evidence right now to say that these patients would benefit from mental health therapy. So we really need continued multidisciplinary research in this area. Slide 36. So looking at a number of therapies a little bit closer, cognitive behavioral therapy is based at least in part on this concept that thought can influence our emotions and behaviors. And so CBT may help improve patient awareness of negative thoughts, behaviors, and feelings about their disease and even their physical diseases, increase compliance with medical recommendations, and support healthy self-care behaviors. Cognitive therapy can enhance prefrontal cortex functioning and inhibit amygdala activation. A recent Cochrane review evaluates psychological interventions for parents of children and adolescents with chronic illness. And while they recognize that there's limited number of high quality studies, they did find that CBT for the parents showed promise in decreasing children's medical symptoms. There's different or organizations and programs such as Creating Opportunities for Personal Empowerment, the COPE program for asthma, which incorporated CBT skill building for children with asthma and anxiety, and found that by doing both, right, the routine medical care plus CBT, there was reported decreases in symptoms of anxiety and asthma. Similarly, in a randomized controlled trial of 437 adults with recently diagnosed heart disease, patients who received traditional care plus CBT had 41% lower rate of recurrent cardiovascular disease event and 45% fewer heart attacks than patients who received traditional care alone. In a recent study of child parent psychotherapy, it was shown to protect against the telomere shortening associated with trauma specifically. And this suggests that maybe for some children intervention, can this intervention CPP could actually reverse the cellular wear and tear of early adversity. Slide 37. So in clinical practice, I think it's really important for everybody to destigmatize mental and behavioral health care for everyone. We need well-child mental health visits or well-adult mental health visits, right? Preventive care. And when we're thinking about who's in this yellow and red zones, who needs a referral to ongoing therapy? And really generally, we're thinking individuals who have trauma-related mental or behavioral health symptoms. So who are exhibiting depression, anxiety, anger management concerns, alcohol or other substance misuse dependence, and they should definitely be offered evidence-based and trauma-appropriate mental or behavioral health services. It's really important to recognize, and I'm sure we're all banging our heads against a wall, that there's real barriers to getting mental health services in the United States access problems, getting people engaged in the process and stigma. So programs within primary care could be really helpful if at all possible in addressing these systems issues. So multidisciplinary teams, integrated behavioral and mental health care within the primary care setting, trying to coordinate with care coordinators, um, having medical home models, all of these can help address some of those barriers to care. It can also be a way to offer brief interventions in the primary care setting, right? So people don't have to go somewhere else for their care. And then thinking about linguistic and cultural congruence between the provider and the patient when at all possible should be prioritized because it really can help address those barriers and improve health equity. 
I think it's also important to know that just like medical professionals, mental health professionals have areas of expertise. And so for this red zone in particular, for patients who have active significant safety or mental behavioral health needs, it's important to help individuals connect with therapists who can really provide trauma-focused services. Um, and then for some people, medications could be an important additional treatment for addressing the sequelae of ACEs and toxic stress, but always keeping in mind to pair medications with other treatment modalities, right? So that you have the sustainable and long-term healing goal um, and, and to really avoid polypharmacy. As I said in the previous slide, it's important to connect our patients to therapists who can have certification or expertise in at least one of the evidence-based trauma therapies. And I wanna spotlight EMDR and the neurofeedback I need to add to this list because they're really emerging evidence-based interventions for trauma and they may be targeting a different, um, more bottom-up approach than things like trauma-focused CBT. So just putting a plug in there, slide 39. I just wanna very quickly highlight some potentially useful ACEs or tools. For example, there's a pediatric and adult self-care tool that you can use if helpful to guide conversations with your patients about any or all of these seven toxic stress mitigation strategies. Next slide. There are also tips for providers and patient handouts on the ACEs Aware website. So you can take a look at all of these. Slide 42. And then just to end with a quick case example of how this could look for a high risk patient. So slide 43. So for pediatric providers, imagine an adolescent. For adult providers, imagine maybe a young adult who's presenting with an A score of four and obesity. And so going back to how we started this, we're gonna gather information like we always do. We're gonna to talk to them about their current concern and we're gonna find out that they're really struggling with sleeping. That's why they're coming. They don't feel rested. They're having trouble falling asleep. They, he, he stays asleep, but he is told he snores. When you ask about nutrition, he says he often has a muffin, donut, or bagel for breakfast. He's not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables usually has a deli meat sandwich for lunch, dinner's often takeout, and he drinks a lot of soda. And he comments that he's tried a lot of diets but says they never work. And then physical activity with COVID and physical distancing, he really hasn't exercised in over a year. And he used to really enjoy walking. He talks about missing walking with his friends and even playing sports. And so you make a note um, that you're running out of time and that you're gonna ask about the other protective factors at future visits. So just, just an acknowledgement that this is a lot and it's not meant to be something that you would do all in one visit, right? That this is a long-term conversation with your, with, and, and uh, relationship building with your patients. Slide 44. And then on exam, you note obesity, you notice acanthosis nigricans, which is a physical finding common in insulin resistance, which could be associated with toxic stress response. You notice large tonsils and you look at your screeners and you notice an ACE score of four and your clinic happens to do depression and anxiety screens, which are normal. Slide 45. And so now you have this male who presents with trouble falling asleep and snoring large tonsils, acanthosis nigricans, and obesity. And so our assessment really includes concern for insulin resistant, resistance and obstructive sleep apnea in addition to the obesity and a high risk of toxic stress because he has an ACE score of four and he has at least one, but possibly more ACE associated health conditions. Strengths, he enjoys walking with friends and playing smart sports. And then looking at our seven uh, stress, toxic stress strategies, he does have poor nutrition and limited exercise at this time. So slide 46. And so you can talk to your patients. You can say things like, I see from this form that you've had some of these difficult experiences. And research tells us that difficult or traumatic experiences during childhood could put us at risk for poor health. And for you, I think that because of your past adverse childhood experiences, the stress hormones in your body are actually telling you to get prepared for future threats. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And it's actually telling you to eat high fat, high sugar foods and store that energy up in case you need it in the future. Um, but the good news is that we can really work with this. We can do something about this. First, I want to make sure that you feel safe now. And I would really pause with a patient because we really want to make sure that 
that we are thinking about active stressors and anything that might be impacting their stress response in ways that we could ensure their safety. And so see how they respond and then move on to, and to work with you on ways to calm down those stress hormones. We could then use motivational interviewing techniques to create concrete goals generated by the patient around these seven stress mitigation strategies to address toxic stress. So we could ask open-ended questions like, how does this sound to you? Have you noticed stress being a part of your weight gain? How do you manage your stress? What ideas do you have for how you could lose weight? We can do, use our affirming statements, right? That's a great idea for how you could avoid situations where you may be tempted to eat high or fat or high sugar foods. Um, and it's wonderful that you've enjoyed walks with your friends and sports in the past, because those are really great ways to calm those stress hormones. And you could always then transition to your reflective listening and summarizing, right? Okay, let me make sure I understand and summarize what the patient said. And do I have that right? Slide 47. And then clinical interventions, right? So for sleep, with ACEs, we know that sleep problems are common. And for this, for this guy with obesity and large tonsils, we're worried about obstructive sleep apnea in addition to the obesity. So a referral to sleep specialists and sleep study is important. And we also wanna discuss, discuss sleep hygiene and relaxation tools, right? And so in this case, the patient identifies that he's, he actually really likes writing and really is excited about uh, wanting to try journaling before bed. For acanthosis, nigricans, and obesity, we would do you know, labs to screen for diabetes. We'd get our lipid panel, maybe a complete metabolic panel. Looking at that physical activity realm, we, would, we could talk to the patient about what they're interested in and really highlighting the strengths and starting from there that they like walking and they like walking with friends. So encouraging that. And, you know, and so he says he's going to do it. He's going to get back into walking his dog every day and inviting his friend a few times a week. And so then we're even getting the relationship domain in there. And nutrition, discussing the benefits of an anti-inflammatory diet and really thinking through what that means and letting the patient identify. And in this case saying, you know what, I'm going to eat more fruits and vegetables. I'm going to target the rainbow in my food choices. Um, and then because, you know, we're extra worried about him, maybe considering recommending omega-3 fatty acid supplementation. And then really in our notes, making a note to ourselves to follow up on these, to see if we're actually making movements on is he, is his weight decreasing, right? And is he sleeping better? Um, is he, is his physical activity improving? And really then adding in other toxic stress reduction strategies at future visits. So thinking to talk about mindfulness um, and other things at that next visit. Thank you so much, Dr. Gagoff. That was really, really interesting presentation. We do have time for a couple of questions. The first question from our audience is, how do community healers and protectors such as clinicians, school counselors, and ministers protect their own mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic? That is such a good question and really timely. I think you know a bit of what I'm gonna say. First, self-care is not selfish. We can't pour from an empty cup. And so all the strategies that I talked about today apply for us too. But I do wanna take a step back and first say thank you to all of you for being at the front lines and really dedicating yourselves to helping others. Thank you, thank you. And I wanna say that we need to be kind to ourselves. We can't make doing these strategies another just stressful to do um, on our list of to do's. Really something, we don't want it to be something that makes us feel worse, right? That we're not doing them, that we're not exercising enough, that we're not getting enough sleep. So my biggest recommendation would be if you could only do one to connect with others, to reach out to people, to call our friends, to gripe with our coworkers, to make time to sit with our loved ones, even if it's just for 15 minutes, because it can be so restorative and it really can lead to using the other seven domains, right? Because then you could start going on walks with people or just go outside with your family. Um, so that would be my biggest recommendation. Be kind and connect with others. And really don't be afraid to contact your employee assistance program for mental health services. I can tell you about a few years ago, I was hitting a really rough patch in my work and I was given four sessions of value-based counseling. And that was pretty powerful and gave me tools that I keep using over and over in my work since, since then. 
And one more question today. Dr. Gilgoff, you presented a wealth of the latest research and knowledge around these evidence-based interventions to toxic stress, but we know that, some, that the research is still not complete. Would you talk a little bit about some of the gaps in the research around intervention impacts? I'm really glad that you asked this question. There are definitely gaps in the research around interventions. So first, we just need more interventions. You know, a lot of research focuses more on what's broken, what causes disease. And then when we're looking at intervention studies, we really want ones that look at patients with ACEs or with toxic stress and those without um, to see which interventions work for which patient. And this could include doing post hoc analyses, right, to see if the high responders could be the subset of patients with high ACE scores. For example, we know that ACEs are linked to headaches. We know that oxytocin has been looked at as a treatment for headaches, but it's has mixed results, but what if the mixed results are because they're not looking at the right subset? What if they look to see if people with high ACE scores are the ones that respond really well to oxytocin and it decreases their migraines better than those without ACE scores, right? And this brings up the need for research into precision medicine approaches. Again, looking at which patients with high ACE high ACEs need which interventions? Because even all of us with ACEs, we're not all the same. So for example, in mental health practice, there's already indications, right? That people who generally uh, respond to ACEs with more of a fight flight response could need different therapeutic approaches than those who respond with more of a freeze or dissociation or learned helplessness response. And could this play out in physical health symptoms as well? And then my last plug would be for doing multidisciplinary research. Right now, a lot of the mental health providers are doing, are going to study their interventions and look at mental health outcomes, right? Medical researchers, we're going to look at physical health intervention outcomes. But if we're recognizing more and more the shared underlying physiology, we really need to come together, right? And do this shared multidisciplinary research that looks at toxic stress, underlying physiology, and behavioral mental health, physical health, relational health outcomes. So still lots to do, but that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, start today helping our patients. And that concludes our session for today. Thank you again to our speaker, Dr. Rachel Gilgoff, and thank you for joining us today.